Good morning, good morning, good morning. And welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to da Daring Dialogues. Daring Dialogues. I am your host, Shantae Charles. I want to say welcome in to those of you who all are joining us today. I want to say good morning to those of you who are a part of the We Dare Squad. And if you want to find out more about that, um, you can email me at reachshante at gmail dot com. So good morning. Uh, we have two very exciting books to look at. We're going to finish up a section in Tony Evans' book, Kingdom Marriage. And then we're going to spend most of our time today reading Dick Gregory's introductory introduction, excuse me, defining moments in black history, reading between the lies. Listen, Dick Gregory is going in <laughs> and it's only the introduction. So I'm excited to share with you what he has to say. And um, he's saying it particularly to black people. And the subject that he's going to be talking about today is appreciating our place in history, appreciating our place in history. So if you just give me just one minute, I got to lubricate my throat this morning. Got my creativity fuel going here. Good morning, Pastor Ben. If you are doing well this morning, please put some hearts on the screen. I'm always interested in seeing how you all are doing. If you ever have a prayer request, please feel free to email that prayer request at reachshante at gmail.com. For those of you all who are connected to me on Facebook, you can always Facebook book messenger me if you have a prayer request and I will pray for you right then and there and leave you an audio message if that feature is activated in your messenger, your Facebook messenger. If it isn't activated, um, then I will leave you a written typed prayer. All right. So prayer is something that I'm always open to do for others. <clears throat> so again, I want to say good morning to those of you who are watching inside of the Periscope app, those of you who are watching by laptop, those of you who are watching by Facebook now, and those of you um, who are watching through Twitter. So there's a few ways that you can now view um, Periscope, which is great. Um, we don't always get a chance to see everybody who's viewing us, but I do appreciate those of you who do write in or who do inbox me and tell me um, that you're watching and what you thought about the broadcast and the presentations. So as I said, we're going to start with finishing up this section in Tony Evans' book today, Kingdom Marriage, and then we're going to go into Dick Gregory's, I would probably say, one of his most defining works. This is um, the last book that Dick Gregory wrote. It was actually still in um, the process of being published when he passed away. And so um, I'm excited because I got one of the first copies as soon as it um, came out. And I have been reading and I'm going to finish up reading the introduction to you today. Again, his topic is appreciating ourselves and appreciating our place in history. So I definitely want to share this. He does drop um, some bombs <laughs> as he's going through this introduction. And so if you're paying attention when I read, you'll hear some of the things that he says um, that I don't think anybody has, has ever said. And so it was kind of shocking to me when I read through it the first time. But I believe if you're listening closely, you'll catch a couple of things that he says. All right. So let's go into kingdom marriage. We've been talking about, um, the last thing that we left off talking about was order in marriage. And that headship applies to both husband and wife. And he talked about the fact that if you are bringing your relationship, if you're bringing your covenant under renewedness in Christ, that if you are in Christ, then you're not under the curse. All right. And unfortunately, a lot of people are still operating their marriage and even sometimes their own life as if they are under the curse. All right. And we're no longer under the curse. And so if you're not under the curse and you and your wife are in Christ, that means your marriage is not under the curse which means that you're supposed to be flowing in the headship that applies to both husband and wife and the promises of God that were given to both Adam and Eve, which was both of them to um, have dominion, all right? 
So we're moving into this last section here called um, Because of the Angels. <clears throat> because of the Angels. Again, he says, when you are living out of alignment, you're living under the consequences of the curse and you've lost your capacity to rule. When you are in alignment, you are living under the blessing and have regained your rule. So the question regarding your marriage is not so much whether he or she annoys you or whether you disagree about certain things. It's whether or not you want to rule your world or lose that rule. It's up to you because God has established a certain positional framework within which we must all abide. And he has done it for a purpose. One of the things that I wrote um, this week that I felt that God was giving me concerning marriage is the fact that um, the enemy really wants to detour people from who they're supposed to be in covenant with, who they're supposed to be married to in the first place. Because, and think about it, why would I want you to marry the person that's going to operate with you in kingdom rule, right? And destroy my the kingdom of darkness. Why would I want you to do that? <laughs> the bottom line is, I wouldn't want you to be in covenant with the person that ultimately is going to help you deconstruct and tear down the kingdom of darkness. And so there's a lot of confusion around this topic. There's a lot of confusion around who people's spouse is. There's a lot of confusion around how do I know um, that this person is the one for me. Let me tell you one huge clue. <laughs> if you and the person that you desire to be in covenant with, if you all are both living upright before God, Mm -hmm. and you choose to say, we're going to get engaged. Let's just start there. And all hell begins to break loose. Chances are, chances are, <laughs> there's, a, there's a big chance, all right, that the enemy is afraid of what you two could become together, all right? And I have my own story behind how the enemy tried to disrupt and derail my engagement, my ministry, my entire life. All right. And so I know this from a spiritual standpoint, but I also know it from an experiential standpoint. That when the enemy sees two people who are committed to Christ, who are committed to the marriage covenant, who are committed to loving each other. All right. And you want to do the honorable thing. You want to do the godly thing. You want to join together in holy matrimony for the express purpose, okay, of fulfilling God's will, not only in your individual calls, but also in your call together as husband and wife. The enemy wants to attack that. As Tony Evans said in one of our prior readings, Notice the enemy did not attack Adam until he had a partner. Think on that. All right, let's keep reading. This often overlooked purpose for hierarchy in the marriage is found in 1 Corinthians 11. Paul began this passage by talking about a woman's hair as her covering, since so she is the glory of a man. He also talked about a man being the glory of God. Paul reminds us after this that the woman originated from the man and was created for the man's sake. But neither is independent of the other since the man is now birthed from the woman. That's the part of the sermon that a lot of people don't get to. <laughs> Sandwiched in between these statements is found the reason behind Paul's emphasis on a symbolic covering that represents the covering of headship. Therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. And remember, he's talking about the woman as opposed to any woman. So this is still in the context of marriage. What does because of the angels mean? The devil is an angel. <clears throat> His name was Lucifer. God created Lucifer to be the archangel. He was an angel of incredible glory as well as unparalleled power and strength. There was only one caveat to Lucifer's control. It needed to come underneath God's order. 
But Lucifer didn't like that. He wanted to be equal to God, to be like the Most High, and he didn't want to have to answer to anyone. In fact, he wanted everyone to have to answer to him, including God. Lucifer didn't like God's prescribed order. He wanted to run his own show, so Lucifer rebelled. He found those who would follow him, and he sought to take a place above God himself. Yet, when he rebelled, he was cursed, and a third of the angels, those who rebelled with him, were also cursed. They were placed on planet Earth, which served as a holding cell until the time God has set for their eternal destruction. In the meantime, God created man, Adam, and from Adam he created Eve. When Lucifer tempted Adam and Eve to also break the divine order, he turned their blessing and rule into a curse. In other words, they got cursed because of an angel. Satan, an angel turned bad, brought about pain in employment, pain in finances, pain in childbirth, pain in the ground, and pain in families. In other words, angels just aren't sitting around doing nothing. They are either supporting the divine order, God's angels, or they're seeking to twist it with another order, Satan's followers. Angels are very involved in our lives and marriages. The good angels we call angels and the bad ones we call demons. <laughs> Demons seek to take their own spirit of rebellion and create chaos in our homes by playing on differences in personalities, desires, and weaknesses. When we give in to these differences in our marriages and place ourselves outside our lanes, men in the lane of God and his rule, and women in the lane of men as their final authority, we lose the capacity to rule our homes, our children, our careers, and more. Ephesians 3 and 10 states, So that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. The angels are waiting for their instructions by looking at how you and I, as members of the body of Christ, the ecclesia, choose to operate. When we are operating correctly, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a signal to the angels to bring God's will to bear on earth. When we are operating out of alignment, the doors are open and the signal is given for demons to bring in even greater chaos. All right. Angels are available to all of us to provide protection, guidance, and more. But a lot of our angels are taking a break because they don't see the order that grants them permission to enter our world and invoke our rule. If you're not in order, <clears throat> in alignment, then the angels won't move because that's what's got the first group cast out of heaven to begin with, operating out of order. When Jesus called Nathaniel to follow him, Jesus told him that he saw Nathaniel sitting under a fig tree. Because of this, Nathaniel believed that Jesus was the son of God. But Jesus told him that he would see even greater things than these. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus was sharing the image of a ladder coming down out of heaven, bringing God's rule. Your kingdom come, your will be done from heaven to earth. This is similar to the ladder Jacob saw at Bethel, where he witnessed the angels descending and ascending. To heaven. The reason many of us aren't witnessing God's hand of intervention, favor, blessings can be because we are limiting positive angelic involvement. Our ladders are strewn across our yard, lying flat or leaning up against the wrong walls. Order is critical because it reveals a heart of obedience and trust. Disorder embodies rebellion and pride. As a couple, you can regain your right to rule and exercise the dominion God has called you to live out. You can get back your power, your answered prayers, and the blessings God has in store for you if you will both align yourselves in the right order under him. And Tony has said some, some very powerful things here when he began to talk about the ladder and the access um, that we have with heaven. The access point is prayer. And then as we pray and as we seek God, and as, as he said, we can pray 
but we also have to align our lives under God's order and under God's obedience. So whatever God is telling us to do within our marriage, whatever God is telling us to do within our profession, whatever God is telling us to do within our home, as we align in obedience to do those things, and then we pray, then we get results and response, right? Um, the other thing that God shared with me the other day was about this whole issue of unity, right? And this whole issue of uniting behind something. And he said it, it, it made sense and it was very plain, but I had never thought of it this way. He said, I want to unite you all under by revelation and by relationship. Satan wants to unite people through rebellion. All right. So both of them have the aim of unity, <clears throat> but it's how they're causing unity to come about. Look at the Tower of Babel. They were all united. The scripture says that that they had the ability literally to do whatever they wanted, that nothing was without, nothing was out of their reach to do because they were united. They were on one accord, but they were not united to build something unto God. They were united to build something unto themselves, right? They were united in a rebellious act. So God said, I got to come down. I got to confuse this because now they, they understand the power of unity but they're not using it for godly purposes, all right? Next week, we'll be back in kingdom marriage, and we'll be talking about opposition, opposition, and how a healthy marriage is all about focus. Mm, mm, mm. Focusing on your marriage, right? Focusing on your marriage. All right, we are moving on. Getting ready to go into Dick Gregory's work. And we are only in the introduction, but like I said, he is going in. <laughs> um, <clears throat> just prepare your mind and prepare your heart. His subject today, good morning, Bespoke. Good morning, Prophet Lakia. Good morning, Apostle Vanessa. If you're still in the uh, room with us. And last time we started in uh, Dick Gregory's book this week, we ended by him talking about culture and how he was saying that white is not a color, it's an attitude. And the next part of this introduction, Dick Gregory begins to talk about black people. Now, I'm already warning you, somebody's going to be upset. I already know. But if you get mad, it's okay. Just put up a little angry face down there <laughs> and, and we'll pray for you. All right. <laughs> um, if you are for the appreciation of black people, you can put up one of those little black power fists. You can put that up there on the screen because that's what we're talking about today. Okay. Not that we don't appreciate other cultures, but what he's saying here needs to be said. This is like, think about your grandpa or think about that rowdy uncle at the barbecue who's getting ready to tell you about yourself. <laughs> and you haven't had anybody tell you about yourself in a very long time. That's the voice you're about to hear from Mr. Dick Gregory. All right, here we go. <clears throat> Black folks. Thank you, Kingdom 66. Black folks. We don't appreciate ourselves. Look here. Anytime an oppressor says, if you have one thirty second of Negro blood, thank you, Pastor Ben, you are the N-word. And he says the N-word a lot in here, so I'm not going to say it, okay? I'm just going to say the N-word. You're an N-word. I say, wait a minute. Think about that. This is my supposed enemy, this is a guy who hates me and will do anything to keep me down. So what he is saying is that in order to equal one of me, because remember, this is the, the black blood, the, the one drop rule. And, and they did say, if you have one thirty second, okay, one thirty second of black blood, then you're the N word. He is saying that in order to equal one of me, 
one black, one whole black person, you've got to put 32 white people next to me. <laughs> but black people don't hear it that way. We hear the negative part of the statement. I mean, if you have a dollar bill, in order to equal that dollar in pennies, you'd have to have a hundred of those little pennies. It's the same with white folks and black folks. We're powerful, creative, and often ingenious. Unfortunately, there are only a handful of us who believe in our greatness. I'm going to take a sip right there. I'm not even done with the first paragraph. <laughs> Preach, Gregory. There are only a handful of us who actually believe in our greatness. This is why I'm always talking about genius. Because if you know the genius that is in you, you will begin to unlock it every single day. And if you don't know that there's genius on the inside of you, please go and read Psalm 119 verses 97 through 100 and unlock your genius. It tells you how, okay? He says, I'm not saying that other people are not exceptional. I'm saying that we are too. Again, we are all from the same stardust. If black people believed in ourselves and not what people say about us, we would be leading the discussion on race relations rather than reacting to it. See, I need to take another sip. <laughs> in fact, we could make the whole world realize how ridiculous racism is. For example, when I participated in civil rights marches many times, whites would attack us with dogs and fire hoses. At some point later, I had to laugh about the situation. Think about it. These folks were so angry that they were acting stone cold crazy, frothing at the mouth, chasing black people with dogs, and even spitting on us. And angry about what? Racism makes no sense. Whites hating blacks just because of the color of our skin? Any rational person knows that we can't control the color of our skin. But it's not our skin. It's who we are that makes them lose their minds. Or maybe it's seeing in our faces the atrocities that they committed in our shared past. So, now you look at this mess we're in, this racist mess that came about because we're not thinking. Slavery has messed up our minds in countless ways. For instance... A black woman is the only woman on the planet who goes to a place called a beauty parlor. Everybody else goes to a hair salon. But our women have been convinced that they are not attractive. They're in the beauty parlor spending good money for what God already gave them. Hair, nails, and lashes. Let me just take a sip right there. I'm here to say, God made everybody, and did God make ugly people? Sears and Roebuck didn't give me nappy hair. The same universe that put the sun, the moon, and the stars in place gave me nappy hair. But when the white person comes in and starts praising his definition of beauty in the media, and we then believe it. If I was here a billion years before you, don't tell me that stuff you're using is not mine. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments freed black people, made us citizens, and gave black men the right to vote, although they prevented us many times from doing so. The white woman didn't get the legal right to vote until 1920. Think about that. That white woman who was not able to vote was the white boy's mama, but he would not let her vote. That was his mother. <laughs> that was his daughter. That was his wife. That was his girlfriend. We keep looking up to the white man, saying to ourselves, oh, I'd like to be like him. For so many of us, our minds are so messed up that we want to be like him, even though it does not even make cultural sense some of the things he does. 
Meanwhile, he's trying to be like us, except we don't know it because he's trying to keep us from seeing what he's doing. People say, well, I don't know why these white folks are lying in the sun trying to get a suntan. Man, hear what he's saying. A suntan, not a sun black. I was doing some research and found an article that said that 80% of the coral reefs have been destroyed by suntan lotion. They've been here, the coral reefs, trillions of years. And if suntan lotion does that to a coral reef, what do you think it's doing to people? The universe will pay you back. <laughs> a white man may, may not say he's trying to be like us, but look at what he's doing. A rose by any other name is still a rose. We don't appreciate ourselves. We don't appreciate what it means to go through what black people have been through and, be, and still be here. Good morning. Think about being under stress all the time and what that does to your body. The adrenaline rush and all the other psychological and physiological stuff. Did you ever walk down the street and see a cat turn the corner and come up on a dog? Ever see what happens to that cat's body? It goes straight up. That's the response that God gave it, the fight or flight response. Its hair sticks up. It shoots out every which way like the big bang of the universe were made of fur. It's the same with humans and adrenaline. Your eyes, suddenly you can see 40 miles away. The fastest animal out there, you can outrun it. You have the energy of you and somebody else too. That's what's meant to happen for just a few minutes until you're out of danger. That fight or flight response wasn't meant to exist 24 hours a day, every day. Now he just said something that I know went over somebody's head. If you are living in the fight or flight response 24 hours a day, every single day, something that's supposed to last a few minutes, but it happens to you all the time. How do you think that will mess you up? Why do you think black folks have high blood pressure so bad? It's a genetic response to the oppression that has been dealt for 400 years and now it's being passed down from one generation to the next. It's keeping you in a perpetual state of fear. And it's being passed down genetically into your children. All right. It's a fight or flight response. And when you're kept in that level of fear, okay, they, they, scientists have now studied this, that there's a genetic trauma that is passed down to the next generation. All right. So when we see children that already come out walking, okay, children that already come out running, I posted a video on, I believe, Daring Dialogues, where as soon as the baby came out of the womb, the baby started walking, it's already got a genetic response in them that time is short. <laughs> they come out the womb saying, I'm running for my life, right? So we have to think about this. Dick Gregory is really dropping some deep stuff here. Let me keep reading. If I were to leave home and go to work knowing a racist was there, I, I would probably get scared but I can't quit my job. Now, that's not a problem for just black folks. Most other folks can't quit their jobs either. They've got mortgages to pay. They have children to send to college. Financial worries are the same with black folks, except we also have to be worried about racism too. I have to go to work. I have to take care of this and that, just like white folks. But with all of the pressure I feel, that fight or flight response, that suppressed fear and rage, it changes my whole body chemistry. 
When I leave work and yell at my wife or my children, it's not necessarily because I'm mad at them. I'm mad at the boss, but it would cost me my job to say something to him. If I haul off and slap him upside the head, the rest of the Negroes will say, he must be crazy. He knew he was going to be fired. That's why when black folks go to church, <laughs> listen, I know somebody going to be mad, but I got to keep reading. Okay. When black folks go to church, our music has got to be loud. I know I'm not going to get an amen. I know I'm not. <laughs> when black folks go to church, our music has got to be loud. Go to a white Catholic church. There's no loud music and they're not hollering. Our music's got to be loud just so we can forget the boss man and the week we just had. So we can have a little bit of peace. We've got to unmess up our minds from what we've been through. We use the music to clear our heads and we move our bodies in dance to shake off the excess stress. Now y'all know Dick Gregory is not lying. <laughs> okay? But what has happened in the last five years is that white supremacy has invaded one of the very few places of sanctuary for black people. How do I know this? Dylan Roof. How do I know this? Charlottesville. Okay? The white supremacists came marching right up to the church while they were having service and stood outside with torches. Mm-hmm. So, if people are taking away your places of sanctuary from the madness and the craziness of this system, what happens to you as a person trying to operate in a level of sanity when people want to keep you in a system that produces continual nonstop fear? Just think on it, all right? So if the white boy thinks that it takes 32 of him to equal one of me, that's why. As I said, we don't appreciate ourselves. We believe what other people say about us. The purpose of this book is to spread the knowledge, to get the world thinking again, and to see what is truly there and not just take what we are told as truth. When I was a little boy, my mama didn't read that well, but we had <clears throat> every encyclopedia you could find. I would blow the dust off of them and read a volume every now and again. Valuing information is something I have passed on to my children. Most of us do that. But keep in mind, your children don't hear what you mean. They hear what you say. So when you teach your black children, you've got to work twice as hard as a white child. They hear you saying they're dumb. One day, my then eight-year-old son, Christian, said to his mother, I want to tell you something, but don't tell dad. I was out for recess, and I forgot I left something behind and went back into the school to get it. I overheard a white teacher say, Christian's so dumb, sometimes I think he is not a Gregory. When I came home that night, Lily and my wife told me about the situation. I went in to see Christian. Dad, am I as dumb as they say, he asked me. And I said, you are a dumb little boy. <laughs> That's what you are. Your mama won't tell you that, okay? But I'll tell you because you are. And I'll tell you because the difference between A's and D's has got nothing to do with smartness. It's discipline. That's all. And your sister, Michelle, my advice is to follow her around everywhere she goes and do what she does. One day when Christian was 13 years old, I was running through the house getting ready to go out and he stopped me and said, how did you know if I started following Michelle, I'd start making straight A's? And I said, the difference between an A and an F is discipline and your sister is the most disciplined person I know. Today, my son Christian is a doctor. That is true. I did not have any issues with my daughters when it came to education. 
Women are smarter than men because most boys spend time playing. Girls make better grades because they are in the house studying most of the time. For the most part, that's the way black girls were raised, to stay in the house. One day, my daughter Michelle came to me and said, Well now, since you made me go to this white school, I'm fixing to go to grad school. Where should I go? Since she was acting so high and mighty, I said, Go to the London School of Economics. She did not even know it existed when I mentioned it. But a few months later, she came to me with an acceptance letter. Today, she has the only PhD in sexual harassment in the workplace on the whole planet. Let's just take a sip right there. <laughs> if she comes in and testifies against you as an expert witness, that's it. You're going down because she is the authority on the subject. Pew, I know that just went over somebody's head, but you'll get it tomorrow. <laughs> Listen, if she testifies against you in the court of law, you're going to jail because she is the authority on the subject. Not the authority in twerking. Okay. I'm going to keep reading. <clears throat> we can get into serious trouble by not valuing education and learning. Did you know that 98% of the children who drown in the summertime are black? Why? Because historically, we weren't allowed in swimming pools because of Jim Crow. I'm going to say that one more time for all of y'all who can't figure out why black people can't swim. 98% of the children who drown in the summertime are black. Historically, we weren't allowed in swimming pools because of Jim Crow. So even something that small has affected multiple generations. Just say law on that. So, <clears throat> before you strike fear in the hearts of your black child, if you, if you have a black child, please get your child in some swimming lessons so they can learn how to swim. Here's the other piece that Dick Gregory doesn't talk about, but this is something that the Lord told me. Because I did ask, why is it that black people have almost this fear of water and fear of swimming too? He said, it has to do also with the trauma and water being associated with death and slavery and the Middle Passage. So there again, there is that genetic trauma associated with water. Now listen to what Dick Gregory says. He said, that law put a bad taste in black folks' mouths, and to this day, I don't know how to swim. On my family's farm, there was a lake a thousand feet deep. I told her, if one of our kids starts to drown, you go get him. I'm not going in the water. I can't swim. I'm not going to play like I can. And when I was home and the kids were out in the water playing, I would leave the house. I didn't even want to hear them call my name when they were near water. Y'all, we got work to do. <laughs> we got all kinds of genetic, we got all kinds of soul detoxing to do. That's all I'm going to say about it, all right? Everyone knows we were at one time enslaved, but many of us think that we're supposed to be slaves, which, by the way, public school actually inadvertently teaches that because they only, again, they only introduce black history in the context of black people were slaves coming over here. That's where they start. They don't talk about they were kings and queens and scholars and professors and we kidnapped them and brought them to America and made them slaves. That's not how the history lesson goes. And again, I challenge you to go to your elementary school, go to your middle school, get your child's history books, and look at them and see what they're teaching them about 
how black people got to America. They only started at slavery. And so if you're a child hearing about slavery, then you are now being programmed to think that your people were born slaves. Okay? You're not being programmed to think that your people were kidnapped and taken against their will from their own culture, their own traditions, and their own society and brought to America. All right? This is what's happening. Let me keep reading. Many of us think that we're supposed to be slaves and act like we believe it too. Look here. When Africans were brought to the Americas, we didn't become slaves until we got here. If you jumped off the ship, you weren't a slave. You were a person who had been kidnapped. You didn't pick cotton on the way over here. It's not in your nature to be a slave. But you would not get that interpretation from anything you see in today's media, which is why off is the best button. Mm -hmm. When people tell me how upset they are about what is out there, what images are being projected, my only advice to you is to turn it off and create your own media. Turn it off, create your own films. Turn it off, tell your own story. All right? Because until the images change, we know the images are not going to change when they benefit the goals of the people whose desire it is to keep you seen by other people as inferior or thugs or criminals or animals or hypersexual. So it's not going to benefit them to change the image. That means you have a responsibility to start changing the image yourself, right? Hats off to kudos to Ava DuVernay, by the way. She's one of the image changers. You see, these people we're dealing with didn't raid a country. They raided a whole continent. I'm from a whole continent. A continent made up of tribes who were at, at some points, they were at war with one another. The Oyos didn't like the Dahomies, who didn't like the so-and-sos, who didn't like the so-and-sos. We black folks had spears. And for a thousand years, we were throwing them at one another. In that way, we were like the people in Europe, who, by the way, were also fighting each other. Uh-huh. Although they used different weapons. Europe is a continent. Almost every single one of those countries on that continent has fought every last one of the others. They didn't have to fight Asia because they were too busy fighting each other all over the continent until they decided, hmm, rather than fight each other, let's go make us some money off of enslaving people. And then the focus shifted. Now in slavery times, Black folks were put on ships in West Africa. That very same spot where the slaves were put on ships is where hurricanes start. Now, a lot of people, what he's going to say, a lot of people talk about this as almost like a folk tale. I saw this going around on, inter on the internet over and over and over again about the hurricanes, all right? So, I'm prefacing that by saying this is Dick Gregory's thoughts on hurricanes, all right? <laughs> so let me just start there. He says that very same spot where the slaves were put on ships is where hurricanes start. Most hurricanes start in West Africa and follow the same trail that the slave ships follow. Then he says this, there is no record of a hurricane hitting America before this. If you don't believe me, look it up. The first Africans were brought to America as slaves in 1619. The first hurricane slammed into this place in 1635. I say a hurricane is the spirit of a black woman. No slave was offloaded until the ships got to the Caribbean. Hurricanes stay below water until they get all the way to the Caribbean. They will hit the United States and come up the East Coast all the way to Maine. 
Now, Canada is as close to Maine as a car is to the curb. But Canada doesn't have hurricane, hurricanes half as bad as we do. Why not? Because Canada never messed with a black woman like we did. Although they did have slaves. That black sister, she's the only person on this planet who can take a butter knife and cut your tires to the rim. <laughs> and everybody says, wait a minute, a butter knife? That is who she is. That's her power. Other folks see it, but we don't. Here's another indication of our power in the universe. Prior, prior to the Middle Passage, sharks had a natural migration. They swam in this particular pattern for hundreds of years. Then the Middle Passage comes along, all of the blood in the ocean, the blood of millions of black people. The sharks changed their migration patterns to follow the blood. They continue to swim along that same route today. Slavery was wrong on so many levels that it changed the world in ways we do not even recognize. That's our power. You know what you can do? Learn what black folks have already done and understand how smart and tough you needed to be to survive back then and even now. Black folks, in my opinion, are superheroes. We can even be invisible when we have to be. Think about your mother's mother. Maybe she was a maid for white people. Now, how many times have you been in a cab and started talking to your friend like the cab driver can't hear a thing? It was the same thing with your mother's mother listening to white people who forgot she was in the room. It was the same thing when the black folks worked at the hospital where they took Martin Luther King Jr. after he was shot on the balcony in Memphis. When they took him to the hospital, he was still alive, which is what the black people who worked there at the time told me. They said that as he lay on the gurney, King was spat on and then smothered to death. Our invisibility is part of our survival. No problem. We can even transform into cowboys despite the fact that there was no evidence of a black cowboy back when I used to watch cowboys on TV. We got till we knew white folks because we had to in order to survive. Now it's time to know ourselves. It's time to value ourselves. I'll give you one example. I can't understand how Negroes with all the humiliation we've been through would join a black group, a fraternity that would paddle their behinds. Let me sip my hot cocoa because he about to go in. <laughs> Let me read that again. I can't understand how Negroes with all the humiliation we've been through, would join a black group, a fraternity that would paddle their behinds. And he doesn't use the word behinds, by the way. We come from a history of humiliation. The white mob that was ready to do all kinds of crazy stuff to you and me, the folks in that mob didn't paddle each other's butts so they could be in the mob. So why? Would you do that to somebody who looks like you? And why would you up and volunteer to have somebody do that to you? I'll tell you why. Because it is another arm of white supremacy. The thing is, when you go outside this messed up country, everybody else in this messed up world thinks we're beautiful. I used to go to Russia all the time. I took my wife Lil with me once. The subways in Russia go three miles down. So far down in the earth, you think you're about to come out the other side. And clean? They're cleaner than any hospital you got in America or any restaurant. Cleaner than anything you ever saw over here. Anyway, we're on the subway and people are looking at my wife. 
One of them comes up and stares right at her. And Lil looks at me and says, 30 million Russians ride the subway every day in Moscow. They're not doing this to one another. I can't believe you let these white folks do me like this. And I said, yeah, the day I'll stand up for your honor, it won't be around 30 million Russians. The odds have got to be better than that. Then I thought of something and said, wait a minute. I've been coming over here five years and they ain't never looked at me like that. Then I figured it out. The Russians hadn't seen black American, the Russians had seen black American men all over the world as soldiers, but had never really seen a black woman. And now they knew how beautiful you are. That's what they're looking at. The way a child looks at a Christmas toy. That's who you are. I couldn't see it because a white racist system told me you ain't nothing beautiful. I couldn't see it because they told me your skin was too black and your hair was too nappy. Beauty is what the world sees when they look at a black woman. It's what it sees when it looks at my wife. It's what it sees when it looks at Michelle Obama, Holly Berry, and Fannie Lou Hamer. Do not let me get started on fine women. <laughs> Beauty, that's what the real world sees. I don't see it, I told Lil, because these white folks done told me how ugly you are and with those big lips and big nose and all of that. Think about this now. For almost 50 years, the Russian people stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with the United States of America in the Cold War. And they're staring at my wife because she's beautiful. So that's the whole game of it. They see what we black folks don't see and what we need to start seeing. Know who you are. Value who you are. Knowing yourself and valuing yourself comes from knowing what's true and accurate. I went to Iran in the 1970s when the Ayatollah Khomeini was in charge, kicking America's butt. He sent his secretary a man to tell me that I had to leave the country that weekend because Iran had word they were going to be hit by a surprise attack from Iraq. Before I left, Khomeini sent me a long letter thanking me for being there. He wrote, you are beautiful, Uncle Tom. Now I had enough sense to know that the admiration he had for me was real. It was due to my own ignorance that I didn't know who Uncle Tom really was. One brother will call another one Uncle Tom like it's the worst insult he can pull out of his whole nappy head, not realizing that the original Uncle Tom was a hero who defied his master. Don't believe it? Do read the book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. The actual black man that actually went against black people in the book was Sambo. So really, if you want to call somebody something, you should be calling them Sambos if they're betraying the black people as opposed to Uncle Tom. Uncle Tom was based on a real person, Josiah Henson. He rescued 118 blacks from slavery. I remember when I was a little boy, I heard the old black folks say, there's some people in Africa that white folks will never mess with and they're not going to mess with because they control everything. He said, these people are the Uncle Toms or the shapeshifters. I just thought that meant that black folks could get real mean, not that they could change into gorillas or elephants or something crazy like that. But in a way, shapeshifters are what we are because black people make ourselves into whatever we need to be in order to survive. Think about Napoleon. That short little French dude set out to conquer the world. And he almost did it too. He had the single greatest military capability in the history of the planet at that time. Had all of Europe trembling while he conquered territory right and left. And then he went to the Americas. That was the first time that little dude messed up. Because it was the first time he messed with black people. The black general Toussaint Leouverture. Now that was one smart man. He had already led a slave revolt and taken over the French colony in Saint Domingo, which is now Haiti. Napoleon decided he wanted the land back. He and his gang managed to trick Toussaint Louverture, who died in a French prison. But the rest of the black folks there gave the French troops such a fit that Napoleon finally said, later for this, we're out of here. Except it sounded nicer because he said it in French. And then he left. He pulled out of the Americas, signed the Louisiana Purchase, and went back to France and did not look back. 
all because of what happened when he decided to mess with black people. Do you hear what I'm trying to say? That's the power we have when we are together, when we do what we need to do. That's why we need to celebrate ourselves. We did that by ourselves, by the way. Nobody gave Toussaint Louverture Overture and his soldiers any help. Many folks think that all black people live off of a system, but most of the time we keep surviving without anybody or anything except ourselves and our God. Look at what Franklin Delano Roosevelt was president during the Great Depression. Roosevelt said, let's create the WPA or the Works Progress Administration, which really should have been called the White Progress Administration. It was meant to put white folks to work so they could earn a decent living. So now here's a white boy digging a hole that doesn't need to be dug. And then his brother comes along that evening and fills that same hole back up but they're working. Anyway, black folks were not included in this program, yet we praise Roosevelt. Black folks didn't get included in Social Security either, not the way it worked then at least. Social Security initially didn't cover farmers and people who worked in domestic capacities like housekeepers, which is what 99% of black folks worked in at the time. So Social Security didn't include us. Consequently, now all these black folks are out of work. How are we going to deal with it? We survived. You doing for me, me doing for you. Maybe I don't have the money to pay you for fixing my roof, but here are some jars of peaches. Or let me watch your children while you go to work. That's who I am. That's who you are. That's how we got by co-oping and trading services. You know, things that people are now talking about going back to. In the history of the planet, nobody else went through what we as black people have been through and survived. That takes strength, smarts, and spirit. And other people see it, even the ones who don't want to admit it. That's why white folks have us take care of their children. Half the time, we raise their children for them. That's what they see in me that I don't see in me, that spirit. And then they try to tell me that I ain't nothing? They know. Consider this a minute. What German would hire a Jewish person to take care of his house? He would sooner burn it to the ground. And I don't know really a single black person who's going around hiring white people to take care of their children. But white folks, they go all over the world and leave my mama back there to feed their children, take care of them, and dress them for school. If you miss that, then you miss who we are. We feed them, we take care of them. They're not dealing with slaves. They're dealing with people who have no bitterness at all. That is who I am. Not just some slave they brought over. The sooner we understand what we are made of, the better off we'll be. And we're coming to a close. In this book, I'm offering information on a variety of subjects and personalities that have influenced the world in a special way. Most of the stories have come to me from having been there. I marched in Selma during the Civil Rights Movement, organized student rallies to protest the Vietnam War, sat in at rallies for Native American and feminist rights, and fought apartheid in South Africa. I've also been to some incredible places and have met some amazing leaders along the way. I've been to see the Taj Mahal and the rest of that stuff even in India. When I came back, people asked me, Greg, Greg, tell me what it was like. I said, I'm going to disappoint you. But what I found out when I got there is the way I used to feel at home when I had five caramels in one pocket, six in the other, and a pocket full of marbles. It's the kind of place where if you don't bring it with you, it won't be there when you get there. In 1968, I did a film with the writer James Baldwin. Baldwin was brilliant. I would just sit and laugh and talk with him for long periods of time. He was like something God just spat out. It was like God told him, you go down there, you'll have some problems, but just keep doing it. A thousand years from now, they'll still be reading what Baldwin wrote, and it will still be relevant then but his writing doesn't let you know what a funny man he was. 
In addition to these incredible experiences, I've also been to jail. Anybody trying to change a country for the better or by simply being a black man on a sunny day is usually arrested, par for the course. I went to jail on nine counts for nine months total for protesting. Jail is not pleasant under any circumstances, but I tried to make the best of it. They put me off in a private room because they knew I might stir up trouble, another protest or something right inside of the jail. There were bunk beds in my room. I took the bottom bunk and attached my book on meditation to the bunk above me to allow me to read hands free. There's not a lot to do in jail, so I meditated for a long while. Next thing I knew, I heard a knocking sound. It was my head hitting the top bunk. I must have been going at it a while because there was blood on my forehead. After my body returned to the mattress, I said, oh, that's what meditation is about. Levitation. Several people witnessed me levitating. It's the fastest way out of jail, I'll tell you that. Self-knowledge and cultural pride can also give you a feeling of levitation. I've read for you the introduction to Dick Gregory's book, Defining Moments in Black History, Reading Between the Lies. I hope you've enjoyed this reading of the introduction. We'll be back next week as we cover chapter one. We begin to cover it where he's talking about searching for freedom. He talks in this chapter about um, money and slavery, Nat Turner's revolt, Frederick Douglass, <clears throat> Harriet Tubman, the 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment, Jocko, and the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Obviously, it's going to take us a little bit of time to cover chapter one, but we'll be back next week to start it. Thank you for your time and attention. I will send you a photo of the cover. Yes, I will. And I hope that you remember that light is the most daring opposition to darkness. So please go out today and be light in your community and more importantly, in your home. Let your light so shine before all men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Take care and God bless.